Today we're joined by Fareed Zakaria, host of CNN's flagship international affairs program, Fareed Zakaria GPS, editor at large at Time, Washington Post columnist, and New York Times bestselling author. Thank you so much for having us, Fareed. Pleasure. So as I was reading about you and learning about your accomplishments, I was struck by how you were, must be driven by an insatiable curiosity about the world. What were you like as a child? You know, I was very lucky. I grew up in a household where that was encouraged. My mother was a journalist. My father was a politician, but he was a kind of uh, intellectual politician. He had a PhD himself. He was a scholarship kid who had gotten to, to manage to get to London University in the middle of World War II to get a law degree and a PhD. Um, so the, the place I grew up in, in, in Mumbai, India, was filled with conversation about what was going on in the world. And India in the 60s and 70s was very much part of this kind of great game that was going on between the United States and the Soviet Union that we call the Cold War. So uh, politics and international life in general seemed a very high stakes game. Mm -hmm. You know, it seemed as though things uh, were very consequential. Uh, and what I think drove me a little bit was, while all that was true, India was sort of at the periphery of life. And I think that sometimes when you're you know, from Nebraska, you're actually more interested in what the New Yorker tells you is happening in New York. And I had that feeling that when I would read uh, Time magazine or uh, publications out of uh, New York, Washington, London, it would feel as though uh, this was sort of amplified several fold by the time it got to little old me in Mumbai. I'd like to talk a little bit now one, about one of your famous pieces, um, Why Do They Hate Us, which you wrote for Newsweek um, in October 2001 in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, and it, people really took note because for the first time you explain what happened more as a result of a rocky road to globalization, not as religious intolerance. Why do you think that idea was so novel at the time? I, I think that the piece was stunningly successful and you know beyond anything I could have ever imagined I think the sing the single most important reason was the timing it was uh, you know actually the the news publication date I think is October it was that it was essentially two weeks after 9 eleven mm -hmm. and at that point to put out a seven thousand word article I think it was that really tried to explain why they hate us what was going on uh, got people's attention and it it moved us away from the kind of simplistic conventional explanation well all you know this is crazy muslims this islam and i point out well if that's been true islam's been around for 14 centuries it can't be that and try to explain as you say the very rocky partial um, and unsuccessful path towards modernization and globalization that the arab world had gone through uh, largely because of a series of dictatorships combined with oil money which had corrupted and distorted these regimes and that ended up in the situation where the only avenue of protest and opposition that was allowed in those regimes was the mosque and the only language of opposition that was allowed was Islam and because of that as the regime became more uh, dictatorial and oppressive the opposition became more violent and jihadi and that that dynamic was at work. I, I think that people step back from that and and again it became more understandable because now you sort of understood well wh why is it happening because it's only happening in the Arab world you know they for, for the most part 1.57 billion Muslims in the world if they were all trying to wage jihad on the United States we'd know mm -hmm. um, and they, you know so sort of suddenly I think shed light on some of the phenomenon made it understandable in terms that were a little bit more um, ones that people could understand that dealt with history economics rather than just saying well it's just these crazy guys who are in you know who believe in uh, in jihad suicide and the second you know a kind of a messianic belief in the world which I think people couldn't do much with that right so is there a formula or some uh, pattern that you think about when you take these complex issues and you boil them down to very digestible bits of information that people care about no, but I do think that it's that there isn't a formula because each one is different, but I do think you have to understand them really well and you have to understand them from a kind of uh, an analytic or historical frame of reference. When people come to me and say that they want to be journalists, the one thing I always say to them is make sure you acquire some kind of expertise. Don't just be an expert in being a journalist. That, to my mind, is sort of meaningless. It's, you have to really feel like you understand economics or 
European history or American, you know, uh, uh, political history because that gives you a grounding. It, it's, it helps you not just with the one thing that you become an expert in, but it helps you understand how to, um, how to evaluate something that's going on in, in the moment, you know. What are likely to be the, pre the historical factors you want to look at? What is the kind of data you should be looking for to figure out what's going on here. And how do you get, you know, Americans specifically to care about, say, what's happening in Ukraine? It's a really interesting question. I mean, at one level, uh, sadly, Americans have cared about the world when they have been scared. Mm -hmm. So during the Cold War, Americans were scared. And they were scared enough because of the nuclear shadow that they got interested in what happened in Nicaragua what happened in Indochina, what happened in Namibia, in, in, in uh, South Africa, Southern Africa. Uh, then that went away, and Americans promptly lost interest in the world. 9-11 suddenly got them interested again. Um, and then f after a while, I think what happened is Americans realized, you know what, uh, these guys are not as competent as we thought. Uh, the danger is not as great. And, and perhaps as importantly, they realized, the appeal of radical Islam is actually much more limited than people realize. So the, that started waning again. We're now in that mode where it's, m it's more difficult to get Americans to care. I think the two or three things we have going for us are young Americans are much more interested in the world. When I go to college campuses, what I'm struck by is these are kids who have studied foreign languages, who've gone abroad, who know somebody abroad, who are, you know, because of the world of social media and the way in which it is genuinely a global phenomenon, they have many more points of contact. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very powerful integrating force. The second is uh, business. And what I'm struck by when you talk to a young entrepreneur now, they may have five people uh, working in the company but they already have a supplier out of Bangladesh. They're looking to see if there are ways they can export the stuff uh, maybe to Germany. Uh, and the, you know, the packaging is being done in Mexico. And so they have again realized that they live in this global economy right. and that they're, tr they're trying to navigate it. So if I use those two forces as ways of getting people more interested, uh, it helps, of course. Nothing helps as much as being scared. So when Russia invades Ukraine, all of a sudden you do get a spike. I view those as windows of opportunity to shed some light. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that you have to ask yourself, in television particularly, are you in the heating business or are you in the, the lighting business? Right. You can always, the heat is easy. Right. Light is hard. And journalism has shifted a lot in your, in your two decades as a journalist and it's, it's gone to digital. So how do you think about that shift? It's, it's fascinating at one level. You know, when I was in college, the most prestigious things one could do were to work in a great print publication. And print was so dominant, people forget. I mean, there were these great empires built on print. Uh, and it wasn't just that they were great and influential. You know, there was that issue, but they were also incredibly profitable. The Washington Post was one, one of Warren Buffett's greatest investments when he invested in the Washington Post for 25 years. All of Time Warner, this huge empire, comes out of one magazine, mm -hmm. Time Magazine. So it was a pretty good business model, not, you know, in addition to being a very powerful um, intellectual platform. That world is gone. I mean, I think that now the truth is uh, you are trying, we're all trying to figure out what platforms uh, matter. I console myself by saying that the one thing that I think is true is that content has become more important because there are so many platforms that what really matters is if you have great content. And if you have great content, you, there, there will be ways to figure out what to do with it. And you know, some of them will, will change and transmogrify. And so I, I don't worry about it that much. I think I'd worry a lot more if I were running any particular platform. Uh, because those can get disintermediated, uh, disintermediated or overrun. But um, again, not an analogy where I'm comparing myself in quality. But you know, Kevin Spacey doesn't have to worry because he might have made House of Cards for the networks 10 years ago. He's now making it for, for Netflix. Uh, somehow or the other, this stuff comes through. What I think it places a premium on, and I think this is a positive development, is it places a premium on highly intelligent, highly distinctive, value-added content. You know, it, it's uh, just news is like a commodity. Um, people need it, 
but it's like ketchup in a restaurant. Lots of people use it, but you don't choose the restaurant because of the ketchup. Right. You know, you've got to do something value added. And you used to be a wine columnist for Slate. Uh, when you pour yourself a glass, what do you favor? You know, I have tried everything and I enjoy everything. I, the, the reason I stopped doing the column was just I realized I, uh, it was interfering with my pleasure of, of, of wine. I didn't want to sit there. I can't write a column that isn't analytic, so I was finding myself researching why did the, Br the British get interested in these kinds of red wines, and it turned out there were, there were very important tariff issues that had to do with the Treaty of Methuen in the 16th, 17th century. And then I stopped and said, wait a minute, I don't care. I just want to drink a glass of wine and have a, a you know, enjoy it. Um, I'm very, ca I, I mean, I'm, my tastes are pretty traditional in the sense that I like um, French wines, Italian wines more than anything else. Mm -hmm. My theory for that is that they've had a lot of tri time to try uh, to do trial and error. So that if you drink a wine, you know, a white wine called Corton Charlemagne, it's made in, in vineyards that were planted in the eighth century. So they've had a lot of time to figure out, you know, if we put it on this hill, it's going to do better. I think that all the other wines of the world are great, but they, you know, they haven't had 700 years to do trial right, and error. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Fareed. My pleasure. My pleasure. You can follow Fareed on Flipboard by searching for Fareed Zakaria.